I don't think that anyone can doubt the critical and financial success of Batman the Animated Series. This cartoon helped propel the animation industry out of the dark ages of the 1980s, moving away from cheaply made shows whose sole purpose for existing was to sell action figures, to sophisticated, often dark stories that would be burnt into the brains of the kids that watched them. However, as beloved as the show is, at the time there were some executives at Warner Brothers that felt like the show could be doing better bringing in a younger demographic. While the show was incredibly popular with teens and young adults, Warner Brothers wanted to appeal to the key demographic that had been eluding them, their young child audience. Their first step at achieving this was to rebrand Batman the Animated Series as The Adventures of Batman Robin, with a mandate that Robin should be used more frequently. The logic being that kids will relate more to Robin than they do Batman, and would therefore find Robin-centric stories more appealing. Following this, they greenlit Superman the Animated Series. Superman is a more bright and idealistic character that would surely lend himself to more positive, child-friendly storytelling. While Estas was successful, the child market still eluded Warner Brothers, and so it was decreed that they would bring back Batman in the form of the new Batman adventures. But it was ordered that each episode must feature Batgirl or Robin. And we all know how that turned out. This brings us to 1998 when producers Bruce Timm, Alan Burnett and Paul Dini went to meet with then head of Warner Brothers TV, Jamie Kellner, to talk about what they'd be doing once they finished the latest batch of Superman and Batman episodes. The crew went into this meeting expecting Superman and the new adventures of Batman to get another season ordered, but instead they were told that neither series would be renewed. Instead, the network wanted a new, more age-appropriate show about a teenage Batman, and that they should get to work on it immediately. At the time, Warner Brothers were very high on their show Buffy the Vampire Slayer and were holding up as the example of the kind of content they should be producing. Now, the irony here is that Buffy was actually quite a dark show at times and was tonally quite similar to what was already being done in Superman and Batman. Still, Burnett, Deanie and Tim understood what was being asked of them, although they weren't necessarily enthusiastic about it to begin with. It wasn't until Bruce Tim recounted what had happened to Glenn Murakami that they changed their minds. Because Glenn was incredibly positive about the idea of branching out into a futuristic sci-fi world. And that was the hook the rest of the team needed. Of course, the irony here is that Kellner thought that by having a younger Batman, it would allow for more grounded, relatable stories for children. Difficulties at school, dealing with bullies, and other interpersonal relationships. But the reality was that it allowed the writers of the show to go create some of the darkest and most disturbing content they had ever made. Looking back on Batman Beyond now that the show is 25 years old, oh god, excuse me while I turn to dust. It is one of the most emotionally complex and sometimes disturbing shows in the entire DC animated universe. So kicking things off, let's look at the very first episode, Rebirth Part 1. The tone of Batman Beyond was perfectly set in the opening scene of this episode, in which we learn about the original Batman's last night as a crime fighter, some 20 years from now, whenever now is. During a fairly routine hostage rescue, Batman suffers a mild heart attack, which leaves him open to getting attacked by one of the criminals. In order to save his own life, Batman is forced to pick up a gun, the very weapon that robbed him of his childhood and any potential happiness in his life, and he threatens to shoot the criminal. While this new Batman costume hides his entire face, you can tell from his expression that, in that exact moment, he was willing to shoot that man. It may not be gratuitous, but the emotional impact this scene has and the despair it causes Batman is palpable. He's ashamed of himself, deeming himself unworthy of continuing to be Batman, ripping his mask off and walking away. Batman is famed for his dedication to his mission. He gave up everything in the pursuit of a better, safer world. But the moment he picked up that gun, and most importantly was prepared to use it, he was no longer worthy of being Batman. Oof. So moving away from the original Batman, I want to touch on how the creative team took the opportunity to revisit some of the goofier villains from Batman Silver Age that wouldn't have worked in Batman the Animated Series, but in a more sci-fi setting would be completely appropriate. The one that really calls out to me is Spellbinder. In the comics, he was an art forger that discovered the mesmeric properties of certain patterns. He would don a peculiar looking costume that, when performing cartwheels, would hypnotize anyone looking directly at him causing them to hallucinate. Well, the Batman Beyond version of Spellbinder had a similar concept, but he used technology to hypnotize people. To make matters worse, rather than being an outright thief, Spellbinder was the school counselor, and he would target the wealthy parents of the children attending the school. The betrayal from a figure of authority 
and a counsellor too. Someone that troubled children are supposed to trust was pretty bad. But for me, the most disturbing thing about this interpretation of the character is his willingness to kill people. Take, for instance, the way that Spellbinder attempted to deal with Batman, hypnotising him, making him think he was going to dive into a warm pool of water, when instead he was diving headfirst into neo-Gotham traffic. Of course, the classic Batman rogues weren't free from the Batman Beyond treatment. Just look at what happened to Bane. Bane was consistently presented as an unstoppable force of hulking muscle, the kind of man that would surely go down fighting to the very end. But in Batman Beyond, we see Bane lived to an old age as an invalid, incapable of breathing without the aid of machinery, confined to a chair. His carer claims that this is the result of years of abusing Venom. In some ways, I think this fate is worse than if he had died in battle. Death itself is a recurring theme in the show. Obviously, Terry is initially motivated by his father's death. At first, he blames himself, thinking his father had been murdered by the Jokers he had come into conflict with earlier that evening, but he soon learns that Warren was killed at the orders of Derek Powers. Powers is another complex villain that spends much of the first season trying to find a way to cheat his own death, first by encasing himself in synthetic skin to mask his new radioactive form, then by testing out a potential cure of cloning his body, editing out mutated cells and transferring his mind over. This proposed treatment is tested on another returning Batman villain, Mr. Freeze, and I've talked about his appearance in Meltdown a lot in recent months, so I'll try to be brief. But when Victor Freeze's treatment fails, Powers orders him to be killed so that they can examine his organs. Freeze's response to this is to flee, returning later that same day in a new suit and enacting his revenge. Mr. Freeze doesn't handle the betrayal from Powers and Dr. Lake well. He promptly tries to murder them before deciding to blow himself up as well. Now, Powers would eventually succumb to his condition. After being set up by his son Paxton, Powers would reveal himself to be Blight on live TV and be forced into hiding. Paxton would attempt to murder his father, but all he really achieved was causing a monumental meltdown, essentially causing Powers to burn out. Although some later comics did try to bring Blight back, but pay no attention to them, they're not canon. For a kid's show, they really didn't shy away from heavy subjects like despair, betrayal, and suicide. And it was like that almost every week. Out of the 52 episodes spread across the three seasons, there are only a handful of episodes that I would consider to be fairly light-hearted. But even then, episodes like Egg Baby or Terry's Friend Dates a Robot would still have their more mature themes sprinkled throughout them. Egg Baby highlights how selfish some people can be and how utterly unprepared they are to become parents, while Terry's Friend Dates a Robot shows the length sad, lonely people can go in order to feel loved. And I really think that by having teen protagonists and setting many of the episodes within the world of children at school, the arcade, the mall, and so on, it gave the writers the opportunity to make their stories all the more horrific. For instance, it's one thing to see how adults deal with stalking, but it's a completely different matter when they are children being stalked. Most viewers probably couldn't directly relate to a district attorney struggling to keep a hold of his sanity while trying to get re-elected, but are kids whose parents are never there for them? A nerdy kid that gets picked on for no good reason? Abusive teachers that take advantage of the power they have over children? Those are some real-world horrors that kids go through, and by framing it through the science fiction lens, it really drove home the idea that the more things change, the more they stay the same. I don't know about the rest of you, but I find that really depressing. Another thing that really stands out to me is the use of body horror. Now, DCAU cartoons were no stranger to this, of course. Just look at the Beatass episode Feet of Clay or Superman's The Way of All Flesh. But I think Batman Beyond took it to another level. Just look at pretty much any episode featuring Ink. Why, in her first episode, Blackout, she forces herself down Batman's throat, leaving him to throw her up all over the Batcave floor. And there's something sexually charged about this scene in particular that I find really disturbing, although maybe that says more about me than it does anything else. And don't even get me started on what she did to her accomplice, Aaron. And you can't mention body horror without bringing up splicers, people that are dissatisfied with something about their own appearance and resort to genetic modification, bringing in animal attributes. Of course, Dissatisfaction with their own bodies isn't a problem that is exclusive to children, but many people first start developing these feelings about their own bodies when they enter puberty. The lead scientist behind the procedure, Dr. Abel Cuvier, would go on to be overdosed with these chemicals by Batman, turning him into an amorphous, bulging, massive meat and veins to the point that he was completely unrecognisable as a human being. And then we have the Earth Mover. Oh my god, Earth Mover. This is, in my opinion, one of the most horrific episodes in the entire DCAU. It's like an old school monster movie. One of the things that I really like about this episode is the way that they produced it. 
In traditional animation, backgrounds would be painted on separate pieces of paper, while characters would be painted onto plastic sheets called cells. Far simpler to use a single background and place dozens of different cells atop of it, right? Well, the Earth Mover is painted into the background, giving him a completely different texture to all the other characters. This makes sense narratively because his whole deal is that he became trapped underground and was bathed in toxic chemicals, effectively fusing him into the Earth. The only part of him that is animated is his glowing green eyes. It's really effective and just sends chills down my spine. Just looking at his decomposing corpse with roots running through him, pumping in those toxic chemicals as he speaks through glittered teeth. Oh, it's just horrific. The episode ends strongly with the Earth Mover using the last of his strength to save his daughter as one of his soil golems falls on top of him, ripping his body apart, turning him to dust. As well as being horrific, the whole episode is morally complex. Bill, the man who unintentionally caused the accident that turned Tony into the Earth Mover, is probably the villain of the episode. After all, he chose to hide those chemicals to save money, and it ended up costing his best friend his life. However, Bill is clearly repentant and adopted Tony's daughter Jackie as a way of making amends. Tony, the Earth Mover, meanwhile, is the victim of an accident and being left alone below ground for over a decade has clearly driven him insane. He is right to be angry about his position in life, but he has convinced himself that it was no accident and Bill wanted to cut him out of their company and steal his daughter. It's just so complex and a clear love letter to classic horror films. I could easily do a whole video about it and in fact I probably will later on. I try to limit these videos to about 10 maybe 15 minutes and I'm already kind of close to the limit and I haven't even had the chance to talk about the director DVD slash VHS movie Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. There's so much to say about this film that it also deserves its own video but just know that the initial reactions to the film within Warner Brothers were not great. The executives were hoping for a more casual Batman film that mothers might impulse buy at Target and watch over and over again with their young children. What they actually got was a story about the lingering effects of child abuse, the toxicity of secrets and how little control we have over who we grow up to become. Sure, the first cut of the film removed some of the more overt violence, but no amount of editing could change the overall themes of the story. But as I said, we'll cover that another time. This was intended to just be a brief overview of Batman Beyond and some of the more mature topics brought up in the show. And I have to say that, if you couldn't tell already, I am genuinely amused by how spectacularly the executive's edict backfired on them. And I'm so glad that it did. Okay, that's the end of this week's essay, which I wrote as part of my ongoing celebrations of Batman Beyond's 25th anniversary. Again, excuse me while I turn to dust. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, share the video, tell all your friends about me, because every little interaction helps. Another great way to help me out would be make use of the thanks button. You can donate a buck or two to help me maintain the quality of these videos. Likewise, I offer channel memberships for $1.99 a month. This will get you early access to my weekly video essay, sporadic members only videos, priority responses to your comments, an icon on your profile indicating you're one of my members, and custom emojis. I'm going to be back next week with a video looking at one of the most significant villains from Batman Beyond, the toxic Derek Powers, also known as Blight. Hope to see you then.